All right, guys, we'll get started here tonight. Sorry for the wee delay there. Uh, let's open it with a prayer, shall we? And we'll get into Psalm 82 tonight is where we're at. Father, we thank you once again for bringing us together. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that is in your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would teach us tonight, that you would guide us. And through this precious Psalm 82, that you would give us that which we need. Feed us tonight, we pray, so that we might put into practice what your word says. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Psalm 82. I've titled this message tonight, The Judge Will Judge Those Who Judge. I like those little fun titles. Uh, because here in Psalm 82, God is dealing with the judges, that they have to judge correctly and that they have to judge righteously. And to them who has been entrusted so much responsibility, they need to keep it in mind that God's put them in that station and in that position and that if they misrepresent God in those positions, and they take bribes, and they lie, and they cheat and steal, and they use their position to oppress, God will judge them. So it's true that the judge will judge those who judge. So we go here to Psalm 82 and verse 1. And tonight we're going to look at some interpretations there's really two interpretations of Psalm 82 that are pretty popular. And I would say that there's truth in both. But in the context of Psalm 82, the judges that he's really actually dealing with in context is human beings put in that position. But we see here in Psalm 82 verse 1, it says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Now, this is one of those psalms that there is a divine council. It's been revealed in the Old Testament, and we'll point that out in a moment, that there is a divine council in heaven that God has set up. And looking at this verse here, we know that the divine counsel is in heaven because he talks about in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So we're going to look at this as a two-edged sword tonight. We're going to look at the place from which God judges, and he meets out all judgment, and that's from the throne of God, the throne room of God. And we're going to see that there is indeed an angelic realm, even a demonic realm, which God is in control over, and he will meet out his judgment accordingly, and he will even use divine beings or angelic beings, not divine beings, to work out his will and his counsel. So we're going to look at this briefly here as we get started. Divine counsel. Now, this is from the Cultural Study Bible, because we have to remind ourselves that the Bible was written from an ancient cultural standpoint. It wasn't written with... Um, the Western American point of view. And so very often when we, we approach the Bible, there's a separation of culture to culture, and we're trying to understand the cultural setting in which the book of Psalms was originally written. And of course, we go to the Bible with our Western eyes. We go, with our, we, we go into the Bible with our American eyes, and often read into the Bible our own cultural perspective. And so there is a place for us 
to understand the historical setting and the world in which the Bible was originally written in. And I do believe if we approach Psalm 82 from that perspective, it will give us a better understanding of what the psalmist was saying. So this is taken from the Cultural Study Bible, uh, NIV, and we'll read it out here. It says, in the ancient world, most cultures believed in many gods. That's true, isn't it? We can think of the exodus from Egypt, that each plague was a judgment against the Egyptian gods. Now, when you think about it, if you're an Israelite or an Egyptian, and you're seeing their gods getting hit by the true God, then you realize that their gods are false. And the God of Israel is indeed the true God. Now, let me point out another incident where we clearly see that different cultures had many gods, Egypt being the first and the plagues against their gods. But the Philistines, do you remember when they got the Ark of the Covenant? They put the Ark of the Covenant in their trophy room next to Dagon, their god. And when they recovered the Ark of the Covenant, they were giving credit to their god, Dagon, which was a merman. It was like part fish, part human. Now, when they got up next morning, Dagon was prostrate before, before the Ark. And prostrate meaning it was placed in a position as if it was worshipping the true God. Now, they didn't get the first hint, so they grab Dagon and they stick it back up there. Next morning, they show up. The head is cut off. The arms are off. The legs are off as indication that this God is a false God. And the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the true God, I'm showing you that this is the true God and that all these other gods are false. So there's that aspect of ancient culture that we must tap into in, in um, like Psalm 82. So in the ancient world, most cultures believed in many gods. And they imagined that the business of the gods was done in council, as typically happened in human governance. This council was made up of prominent members of the Pantheon and presided over by the chief god. That's the old mindset there. At various times and places, gods such as Enlil, Marduk, Ashur, or El, unlike Israel's understanding of Yahweh, the gods of these Pantheons had no overarching plan. It rather seems that decisions were made ad hoc. So if you've ever watched any of those, um, any of those Greek movies where you got the gods and they're up there and they're playing with human beings. <laughs> um, Jason of the Argonauts is the one that, that comes to my mind. And the gods up there are bored. So what do they do? They start messing around with with Jason and his men, you know. That's the, but, you know, in ancient culture, though, that was their understanding, that you better not uh, make angry any of these gods, otherwise you will lose. In, in what area they seem to be an authority over, you will lose that. And so they would often try, even in false religions, to appease their false gods by offerings. And so even though that's twisted and messed up, we can still see that God had originally created man to worship him. And they went off into worshiping idols, even to the point that they thought they could appease their false gods by offering the right sacrifice. And if you, if you happen to be chosen by some of those cultures your life wasn't very long. You were told, hey, it's a privilege. We're going to sacrifice you, and it's a privilege because we're going to give you to one of, you know, to our gods. And it's like, wow. So anyway, um, 
Israel had the true understanding of the true God, where all these other cultures were plunged into falsehoods, lies, deceit, and they ended up worshipping false gods. But our God, unlike these false gods, he has an eternal plan, and he's always had a plan, and he brings about his purposes. And he doesn't need other gods to help him bring about his plan. All the power belongs to him. Um, it rather seems that decisions were made ad hoc. This means of cooperate operation was a reflection of the idea prominent in the ancient world that one's identity was found in their community. Just as individual people found their most significant identity in their clan, so the gods also experienced community and acted in corporate solidarity. Again, we're not saying that this mindset is correct, but what we are saying is this is the mindset of the ancient cultures around Israel. Um, the idea that the gods operated in community, however, posed serious problems for the theology of Israel in which only one being had divine authority. And that's the true God. He doesn't need other gods around him to help him bring about his purposes. You see, um, human beings, we struggle to compute in our minds <clears throat> the existence of the great God who controls everything, who's over everything, uh, this theology did not eradicate the divine counsel. Um, so we'll, we'll go to Job 1 verse 6 here uh, after this note. And we're covering one of the interpretations of Psalm 82. But I also want to point out to you some of the misuses of this interpretation. As I pointed out to you in the beginning... Psalm 82, in actual context, is dealing with human beings in positions of authority. They've been placed there by God, and we know that to be true because he says in one of the verses, you will die like men. Angels don't die like men. They don't die like men. All right. Um, so rather than being comprised of various gods, the council featured the sons of God over whom Yahweh presided and whose activities he delegated. So Job 1.6 will go there first. There is a fascination with subjects like these, and that's what I want to uh, basically in, inadvertently come against. Um, we recognize that these things are real in the Bible, but when some people discover Genesis chapter 6, for example, and they discovered that um, there were giants and all of that, how many people have gone crazy with these doctrines in our day? What's that? You think? Yeah. Yeah, people have gone crazy. And the reason why they've gone crazy is because we're not meant to spend our whole time and our whole attention wondering who the sons of God were in Genesis chapter 6. We can talk about it. Here's the thing. We need to emphasize what the Bible emphasizes and de-emphasize what the Bible does not emphasize. And we often need to reassess our teaching, line it up with the Bible and say, are we majoring on what the Bible majors on? Or are we majoring on minor issues and making that our biggest topic and our chief point of concern? Finding out who the giants are in Genesis chapter 6 will not make you grow spiritually. It's an interesting subject and we can talk about it as we hit it in Scripture, just like we're hitting Psalm 82 tonight. We're hitting it, so we're talking about it. But if we spend our whole time obsessed on this subject, we're going to be missing the gospel. All right, so it says, Job 1.6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God, let's just stop there a second. 
Who are the sons of God in this passage? Angels, Angels amen. But it would be wrong of me to say that whenever sons of God are mentioned, it's always angels. I would be misappropriating other texts in the Bible, which also refers to humans as being sons of God. If I was to tell you, every time sons of God is mentioned, it's always referring to angels. Not so. Not so. In fact, in our New Testament, we can think of multiple places where Scripture says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we shall be called, I know Greek says children of God, but sons of God. And for as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God, right? Uh, go ahead, Jackson. I heard a, comment, a commentator on that once. He said, I don't know if this is true or not, but he said, sons of God refers to a direct creation from God. So the angels are a direct creation. Yes. But we aren't until yeah. we're born again, and then we're called sons of God. But yeah. Kind of interesting to think about. Sometimes Israel in the Old Testament were referred to as sons of God too, uh, which can be, you know, overlooked by commentators. In this context, we can definitely say it's referring to angels, right? That's why in Genesis chapter 6, and I wasn't planning on going there, when it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they chose wives for themselves, many do believe that it is fallen angels, right? Who selected these women somehow, and then the offspring of these uh, you know, people who got together were Nephilim fallen ones. I'm not going to say that that didn't happen. I don't know. But sons of God, by some Bible commentators, they reckon it also references human beings in that context. So, you know, getting that wrong will not affect your salvation, is what I'm trying to say. It's not, it's not a salvation issue. It's not a reason to leave a church over, right? If a pastor gets up and said, these are fallen angels, they say, well, that's it for me. I'm out of there. Or if the preacher gets up and said, no. I believe that these were the godly line of the human beings that chose who they wished and they, you know, uh, corrupted the, the uh, human line. Regardless of that issue, it, it's not very clear in the Bible. It's not absolutely clear, so you can allow for both interpretations, is what I'm saying. Now, the sad thing is, uh, it's not an issue to leave the church over, but some people might make it an issue to leave a church over. All right. Now, now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. What we get from that is that Satan has to give account to God, the counsels of God, that we do not have a devil running around freely, doing whatever he wants. He's limited by God, as we even see in the story of Job. He's limited even in the book of Revelation, where he's cast down and he has great wrath, knowing his time is short, which would describe a limitation, would it not? That he's limited by God. And so if we have in our idea... This, this, this devil running around and doing whatever he wants. Then we have a false view of who the devil is. Because if the devil was running around doing whatever he wants, there would be no church left. This church would not exist. No churches would exist if the devil had the free reign that people claim he does. Um. He is a being that does have power, and we do need to respect that. We ourselves are no match for him, so we submit ourselves to God. And then we resist the devil, and Scripture says the devil will flee from us. We, we don't go around slandering Satan. We don't go around thinking we have the power to bind the devil and do all of these crazy things. 
because that simply isn't the case. We need to submit to Christ, and we need to recognize that the enemy, the wicked one, cannot harm us because we're in Christ, and the enemy can't do anything in the life of the believer without divine permission. Without divine permission. We should comfort us in reference to our trials. And it should comfort us also in reference to our warfare. That if we are going through spiritual warfare, God has permitted that. And if God has permitted it, it means he's in control of it. He's sovereign over it. And he will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to endure. And um, he will not be able to take your life without God's permission. You know, he's limited. And if you don't believe me, go back and read the first two chapters of the book of Job, and you'll find that to be the case. Go ahead. Job's life is about to be caught up in the heavenly strategies as the sea moves from earth to heaven. Yes. Where God is holding counsel with his heavenly Neither Job nor his friends ever knew about this. The angelic host came to God's throne to render account of their ministry throughout the earth and heaven. Yeah. And he says, like Judas among the apostles, Satan was among the angels. But there's actually a reference in 1 Kings chapter 22. Yes. And, and it kind of gives you a picture of that. It does. And I'll read that as well. It says, Micah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. And all the hosts of heaven standing by him in his right and to his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab to go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said uh, this while another said that. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, How? And he said, I will go out and be a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Then he said, You are to entice him also prevail and go and do so. Do so. Amen. That's, that's pretty interesting. Amen. Um, In fact, that, that chapter that you read, you guys should write down 1 Kings chapter 22 because that will give more insight again into the divine counsels of God where God even uses evil spirits to bring about his purpose. In 23, is interesting. It says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of mm -hmm. all these your prophets, and the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. That's interesting because God didn't actually do it. No. He allowed somebody else to do it, but That's right. that he is the one that put it there. Right? Yeah, he wasn't the author of the he, lie. He wasn't. Yeah. But he sovereignly permitted the evil spirit to put the lying prophecy in the prophet's mouths. Basically, he gave them over to the sin that they were already inclined to commit. And that's how we can see God's sovereignty Amen. In, in our lives, through our sin and other people's sin against us. God doesn't do the sinning, but he'll allow it. Yeah. But he's got a point he's trying to bring out. He's trying to show us something Amen. about himself, about our, ourselves, that bring us a trial. That's pretty awesome to consider. Somebody said that false teachers are a judgment on the church. It's like God has given us over to that which we want to hear and listen to. And the itching ear thing is we accumulate to ourselves teachers to satisfy that itch. And um, I, I believe in 1 Kings 22, that was the same scenario, was that Ahab wanted a false prophecy. And, and God showed his faithfulness, so didn't he? Because he sent him a true prophet. In the midst of all that, there was one prophet in all the bunch that gave him the right prophecy, and he was thrown in prison because of it. Yeah, he never speaks anything good concerning me. It's like, well, the important thing about the prophet is he speaks truth. Whether it's good for us or bad for us, in the end, it's good for us if we respond to it, if we don't like what we're hearing and we say, you know, that's truly from God, and we repent, then that's a good thing. So, amen. No, that's good, but thanks for reading that out. Um, I was aware of 1 Kings 22, and I've got it in a note, but I didn't cover it. But I'm glad you read it out, because that's an excellent chapter that really 
gives us insight into what's being spoken of in Psalm 82 and verse 1. Um, Another note on this, these council members were not gods who had autonomous divine authority on a par with Yahweh's. And I think we see that with the 1 Kings 22, is that God's in charge. These angels were created beings. Even the demons were created beings who are now fallen. And uh, they even they have a purpose in bringing about God's sovereign will. Uh, they, you know, they, they're a tool of judgment in God's hands and a tool of correction as well. But they were spirit beings given a role in Yahweh's governance of the world. And that's true. God does have a function for angelic beings. And I would encourage you, never go beyond what Scripture says about angels. Um, there is a place to study angels but there's enough in Scripture for us. But when we try to go beyond what Scripture says, that's when we get into trouble with this kind of stuff. Um, so um, there were spirit beings given in a role in Yahweh's governance of the world. Intimations of the divine counsel in the Bible include the plurals. Now, I would say about these plurals, I do believe it's God counseling with himself. There's um, two different viewpoints. Some people believe God's counseling with the angels when he says this in Genesis 1.26. The problem with that, though, is angels are not our creators. God is. And so in Genesis 1.26, and this really challenges the, um, the oneness view of God, which is false, the anti-Trinitarian view is when you look at God speaking of himself in a plurality, that's evidence of the triune Godhead. Um, because Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image, right? In, in our image. Yeah, so let us in our image. That has to be God. That has to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit counseling in the triune Godhead to say, we're going to create men. Angels aren't created or creative or creators. That's right. That's right. So it can't be, Genesis 1.26 can't be referring to angels. Now, that is the position of the Jews when they look at Genesis 1.26. They say, God here is speaking to the angels because the Jews don't recognize a Godhead. They don't recognize, you know, a triune God like we do as believers, right? They don't recognize that. Not the Jews that reject Christ, that is. Now, Genesis 3.22 is another place where God intimates that, well, he now that they are like, he, man is like us, knowing good and evil, um, and, and there you have a plurality being mentioned again. In Genesis eleven seven, 7, that's the Tower of Babel, you have, let us go down and see. So you have God speaking in plural terminology again. You, the other place which we haven't hit yet is Isaiah 6, 8. Who will go for us? And so there are Bible interpret, you know, Bible commentators who believe it's referring to the divine counsel. I would say that's true, but it's the divine counsel in the Godhead, not God communicating this with angels. That's just my view. If you have a different view than me on that, I'm not going to, you know, brand you a heretic or anything like that. So even if you brand me one, I'm not going to brand you one. So, um, not, not with something like this. Uh, but Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, is, is a key text. And it's a CNIV text note rendering sons of God, which is likely the correct reading. Uh, Job 1.6, Job 2.1 just repeats basically what Job 1.6 says, um, which both read sons of God, likely the correct reading. Reading. 
Um, Isaiah 6, 8 will be the next one that we go to, though. And then we will look at this Deuteronomy passage here in a moment, because I think that's very important. Um, so it said, but the passage in 1 Kings 22, the one that Butch read out, is the clearest attestation of there being a divine counsel in the heavens. Um, so let's look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. We'll look at that. Well, let's read this out and then we'll look at it. Um, but the passage in 1 Kings 22 is the clearest attestation. It was logical to portray divine operations this way because just as a king had the prerogative of having a court of minions to do his bidding, Yahweh also functioned as a king and would be considered to have such prerogatives. So the angels are those who do God's bidding. They are the ones who carry out God's commands, God's word. He commands the angels and they go forth in his name. You'll see that in Psalm 103 mentioned there, that, that he does that. Now, the calling of Isaiah in chapter 6 and verse 8 Notice that God speaks of himself in singular terms and yet in a plural terminology in this passage. He's singular and plural at the same time. Isaiah says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Is that plural there? Then I said, Here I am, send me. So he answered the call. And of course, we know about Isaiah. His lips were unclean. And God had to touch his lips with coals of fire and said, there, you are now clean and you can speak forth in my name. But we'll go to Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. This is an interesting passage and you probably have some good notes on this. Um. And we'll break down the, um, the net Bible note on this because I think it's very important. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls discoveries were quite significant uh, with this passage. Um, it is the oldest known portion of Deuteronomy 32, and they translate it Sons of God. Um, our newer translations follow suit with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the King James goes off the Masoretic text, which is Hebrew. Um, well, let's read it and we'll, we'll explain it as we go along. It says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided up humankind, so God did all of that, right? God made up the nations, God divided humankind. If, if we look at the Tower of Babel, why is it called Babel? Because it's, what does Babel mean? Confusion. To our human eye, it looked really confusing. What? But God was actually categorizing people. If you were of a certain family, a certain tribe, you were given a certain language in that moment. And only you could understand one another, right? The same applied for others. And so God deliberately, so what appeared to be chaos was actually divine order taking place. And I think if we learn anything from the Tower of Babel, what may appear to be chaos to us might be divine order to God because they couldn't understand one another except their own family, except the people that they were a part of. So what happened? Well, I'm not going to go where I'm not understood. I'm going to speak to this person because they're speaking the same language as me. And so God divided the people, categorized the people in the way that he wanted, right? And this is what this passage is referring to. It's a direct reflection back to the Tower of Babel when they wanted to hang out with each other and have one ruler and dictator over them, 
That was an act of rebellion by man. So God said, you know, no, go into all the world and, you know, uh, subdue the earth. So this is what this passage is referring to, what God did at the Tower of Babel. It says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided up humankind, God did. There's a reason why no one else understands the Scottish. I'm just saying. But the Scottish. (laughs) He set the boundaries of the peoples. But notice, this is a very, this is from the Net Bible, by the way. It says, according to the number of the heavenly assembly. So the hint in this text is that God did indeed put in angelic beings over certain realms in different parts of the world. And I know sometimes there are people who go nuts on this, and that's where we have to, um, we have to plead caution. Um, if you get deep into spiritual warfare teaching, for example, you will be taught, oh, you've got to deal with these territorial spirits. Uh, how many of us have heard that? It's like, no, we we need to recognize that, yeah, there is a God of this age that blinds the eyes of unbelievers. We've got to realize that's the real battle. The real battle is in the realm of the gospel, that when we're sharing the gospel, we need to pray for the eyes of those who have been blinded, uh, judicially blinded, given over to the enemy, to be set free from that, to come to salvation. So, you know, you're not going to have any advantage by finding out, well, what territorial spirit is over Rock Springs, Wyoming? Who cares? God knows. What has God told us? He hasn't told us in his word. Well, before you go out and preach, Brian, you got to find out what territorial spirit is over Rock Springs, Wyoming. Um, the Bible or or already tells us it's the spirit of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. That's what it is. I don't need to find out exactly what it is. We'll leave that with God. We preach his gospel. We preach his word. We pray and we ask the Lord to set the captives free. But it would be wrong for us to hide ourselves away operate and pray morning, noon, and night for these territorial spirits to be brought down and we never, ever go out and preach the gospel. Don't you think the gospel has God's power in it? You see, we're called to preach the gospel and you're going to find more spiritual power in the gospel than any other resource on planet Earth. And all of these other things are distractions to lead us away from what we should be doing, which is preaching the gospel. When I had people knock on my door, they had no idea what kind of spirit I was under, but they came with the love of God to get me to go to church. And thank God they did. They didn't need to know the ins and outs of all of the spiritual activity that ever took place in my life. They just needed to give me the love of Christ, preach the gospel to me. Disciple me. They didn't need to know my whole history. And we go astray when we get into those types of things. And that's why, looking at this tonight, we have to remember that. But this is the, this is the subject that's in front of us, so we will cover it. Um, the Net Bible says this. In the Hebrew, it... The, the real Hebrew rendition of the sons of Israel, or um, how many of you in that portion has sons of Israel translated? Okay, that's an option. The Masoretic text translates it the sons of Israel instead of the sons of God. Uh, the idea, perhaps, is that Israel was central to Yahweh's purposes, and all of the nations were arranged and distributed according to how they related to Israel. Um, a Qumran fragment, and that's from the Dead Sea Scrolls, has sons of God. Not sons of Israel, but sons of God. 
While the Septuagint, that would be the Greek Old Testament, reads um, angels of God. So think about this. The, you have the Greek Old Testament that was translated by Hebrew, Hebrew men who spoke Greek as well. And they translated it angels of God. Interesting. Um, presupposing uh, sons of God is undoubtedly the original reading. So the proof of the manuscript evidence weighs more heavily in favor of sons of God than sons of Israel. Um, it's not a salvation issue, but it does have an impact in how we look at this passage. Um, so, sons of God is undoubtedly the original reading. The Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew from which the King James uh, came from and some of the older translations and LX have each interpreted it differently. The Masoretic text assumes that the expression sons of God refers to Israel. And they go off of Hosea chapter 1 verse 10 on that issue. While the Greek Old Testament has assumed that the phrase refers to the angelic heavenly assembly. Uh, look this up later if you like. Psalm 29 verse 1. Psalm 89, verse 6, and the psalm that we're looking at tonight, Psalm 82. The phrase is also attested in Ugaritic, where it refers to the high God El's divine assembly. According to the latter view, which is reflected in the translation, the Lord delegated jurisdiction over the nations to his angelic hosts. Uh, while reserving for himself Israel, over whom he rules directly. Now, I wasn't going to look at this passage tonight, but we will. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13 through 21. Let's look at this. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13 through 21. There is a realm that's outside of our understanding. There really is, and the Bible does cover that. It does teach on the real existence of angels, uh, the real existence of demons, but you will go crazy on this issue if you forget that God is sovereign over all of it. That's when, that's when you go nuts. That's when you start devoting your whole prayer time to try and bind spirits and all of that kind of stuff, and and um, been there, done that, wore the T-shirt, don't want to go back. Daniel 10. When we get caught up in all that stuff, we're getting caught up in things that we will never fully understand. We're going beyond the realm of our existence. But Scripture does teach this, and so we have to look at it. Daniel 10, 13 through 21. It says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia... We've stood me 21 days. This is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. But Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him, and stood before me, O Lord, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me, and he said, O man, greatly loved, fear not, peace be with you, be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will, I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince." So Daniel is given a little glimpse into some angelic activity and into some warfare that did take place. But let me warn you here. 
Daniel really didn't know this before. He's just praying. Do you know what Daniel's doing? He's praying and he's repenting. That's our job. We leave the angelic activity to the angels, right? And we do what we're called to do, which is pray, repent, preach the gospel. And plus, Daniel was a prophet. What Daniel experienced here isn't a normal experience for all Christians. This, you know, yes, I do believe that every Christian has angels sent to minister to us who will be heirs of our salvation, uh, to, to those who are heirs of salvation. But we don't need to know everything about this. We, we, we do what we're called to do, which is to pray, repent, read our Bibles, preach the gospel, teach God's word, and leave the angel stuff to the angels, right? So um, when we get into trouble is when we try to dabble into these things to try to figure it all out. We have to accept that it is in Scripture. We embrace that reality, but we trust God with it. You know, he's given us a glimpse into our realm that we will never fully understand. Um, Hebrews 13.9. Hebrews 13.9. Turn with me there. Have you ever known anyone to get carried off in this type of stuff? To, to get carried away into this type of stuff where they just forget reality. It's like we're living in this false spirituality, making claims of things that we have seen or not seen. And Scripture warns us about that. Uh, scripture says about some of the uh, false teachers, they're vainly puffed up by the things that they have claimed to have seen. We need to be careful of that, that we don't um, get so deep into things we do not understand. We accept what Scripture says. We thank God. The angels are real. And yes, even demons are real. But we trust God with it. We don't go beyond what's written. We fulfill our role that we're called to do. But do not be so caught up in these issues that we get led astray by it, is what I'm trying to say. Hebrews 13.9 says this, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. Part of our growing in Christ is when we begin to focus on what really matters. And we put things in their correct categorizations. Um, there have been teachers who have devoted their whole life to Genesis chapter 6. And I've often thought about that, and I thought, yeah, it's an interesting teaching, but couldn't that time have been better spent preaching the gospel? Just a thought. That's my observation. You can agree or disagree with me on that. That's fine. But I would say this, that Paul, who relays some of these things in Ephesians 6, Paul himself said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, in him crucified. So whenever Paul did touch upon these issues, he didn't lose himself in them. He still emphasized Christ and the gospel and the cross. And so, yes, don't lose yourself in these things. R.C. Sproul says this about the passage in view, or more, more or less the Reformation Study Bible says this and kind of puts his name to it. This short psalm presents some difficult problems. Chief among them is the gods mentioned in verses 1 and 6. A number of scholars take this as a reference to angelic powers, lesser spiritual beings who make up God's heavenly counsel. 
Yeah, there's a biblical case for that, isn't it? A second interpretation understands gods literally as deities made subordinate to Yahweh. The most probable interpretation, and I would embrace this reality for the rest, the rest of the psalm, is that the gods are human judges. The Hebrew word Elohim, gods, is used of human judges. Exodus 21, verse 6. Exodus 22, verse 8 and 9. Within Psalm 82, the human nature of these gods is indicated by verse 6 and 7. A rough paraphrase is, as judges, people may call you Lord. That's not with a capital L. But you are as mortal as anyone else. I would say it's a two-edged sword. Psalm 82 verse 1 is dealing with the divine counsel, but now the rest of the psalm is ultimately dealing with human judges who have been placed in high stations of authority, which brings me back that the judge will be judged by the judge, those who judge. So notice now he's calling to man. He's calling to human beings. The Bible wasn't written to angels. It was written to human beings, right? right. Amen. I'm glad we agree with that. <laughs> uh, amen. Hey, we've made, we've made inroads. That's good. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Who is God talking to here? Not angels, but human beings who have been entrusted with authority and they have forgotten to represent God wouldn't, in that position. Wouldn't he, if you read this, in verse 1, God takes his, his stand in his own congregation. Yes. He judges in the midst of the rulers or gods. So he's judging in the midst of them and how long will you judge to me, when I read it that way, it sounds like he's actually referring to those rulers or those gods. Yeah. You know what I think, and this is just my opinion, um, when you read the passages, for example, in Isaiah 14, where he says, I will ascend into heaven, I will be like the Most High God. In context, he's actually talking to the king of Babylon, and then he breaks into clear referencing of Satan, you know, and I would say that this psalm is doing the same thing. Like in, in, in verse 1, we're having a glimpse into heavenly counsel where God judges from. And he's addressing the judges of the earth from his vantage point. And, uh, I, I get it. I, I yeah. see it too. Yeah. <laughs> totally yeah. See it. yeah. It's just that I was just reading it. I'm like, well, hold on. It sounds like this, but I, I totally get you on that. Because Thank you for... You could read it that yeah. way too and you go... Yeah. Okay, so he's surrounded by the angelic beings and he's ruling from that position. Yeah. That's a difficult one to, to kind of actually pin down. It is. It is. It's not either or, it's both, but yeah. it, it begins with the angelic, but then it comes into the human beings in positions of authority who he will judge because they're misrepresenting who God is. They're judging unjustly and showing partiality to the wicked and then Sila. And then they are reminded and exalted, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. One of the weirdest teachings I ever heard on this passage was there was a man who I do respect, a great scholar, he used this whole psalm as dealing with angelic beings. I'm like, no, I don't think the whole psalm is addressing angelic beings. <laughs> Some of it is, the beginning of it is. But clearly this is dealing with judges on the earth. Um, then he goes on to say, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That would be earthly activity, earthly realm. Then he goes on to say, they have neither knowledge nor understanding, they walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. So he's saying those in position of authority 
which I think we're seeing in our nation right now. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken because they are causing great confusion, great strife, because they are not using their position wisely. Now, we have to remember that though they have been put there by God, they will be judged by God for their judgments rendered. And that should be, um, you know, like the psalmist, he says in Psalm 73, but I went into the sanctuary and I saw their end. It's not that he, you know, we get very frustrated. Now, the next verse, I think, is important to touch upon, verse 6, because verse 6 has been one of the most misunderstood texts, especially with those in the word faith movement. Common sense would say there is no way that we can take this verse and start calling ourselves gods, right? I mean, if there's any if there's any decency in us, if there's any remote fear of God in our heart, if there's, if there's the least modesty that resides in us, which should as Christians, humility, we would know immediately that this verse is not giving us license to call ourselves gods. I said, God said to him, you are gods, small g. And by the way, in the Hebrew, it's Elohim. Sons of the Most High, all of you. Now, obviously, we are not deity. No human being has a right to call themselves a god. So we can't take this verse, and we can't claim to be gods. Go ahead, Jackson. I had a Mormon friend point to this verse and try to convince me that we were divine and we could ascend to become gods. And how did you address that? I looked it up on Got Questions. And, said, well, this and then dealt with the accordance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, from the John MacArthur Study Bible, he has a good note here. Um, and the answer to this question is, I said kings and judges are set up ultimately by the decree of God. God, in effect, invests his authority in human leaders for the stability of the universe. And we'll find that in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, that God has set up those in authority, right? So in other words, they're God's representatives, not God's themselves. They're Elohim set up by God to judge in his place. And if they misrepresent him, then they will be judged accordingly. And so this is where people should be slow to put themselves in high stations in life or in high stations in the church. Um, obviously, it talks about teachers being judged with a greater severity. And that, obviously, uh, one time I got up to preach and there was a friend of mine who deliberately left that passage open <laughs> right before I preached. And I'm like, yes. I really probably shouldn't be doing this, but here I am. And I would commit a worse crime by, by disobeying the call of God, because God uses imperfect people. Um, but God may revoke this authority. Uh, you are God's. Jesus, in quoting this phrase in John 10, 34, supported the interpretation that the gods were human beings. Isn't that wonderful to know? Context interpret scripture with scripture so this verse um, Jesus clearly shows in John 10 34 that he wasn't referring it to angels he was referring it to human beings right he has said you are gods supported the interpretation in a play on words he claims that if human leaders can be called gods certainly the Messiah can be called God Children of the Most High, created by God for noble life. Now, obviously, MacArthur does a very good job with this passage, but does anyone have anything else on this passage? Well, I was, I was just reading John chapter 10, okay. just, to, just to make sure the context of it, right? Mm. And it's, it's interesting that they actually use this verse. I actually saw Joyce Meyer use this yes. exact verse to say that we are God's. Yeah. But... <laughs> 
He says, it, it, it says in verse 31, he says, the Jews picked up the stones again to stone him. And then Jesus answered, I, sh I show you many good works from the Father, for which of them are you stoning me? And the Jews answered, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be a god. And then he says, Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said, you are gods? And if he, and if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and from scripture cannot be broken. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting because he's, he's actually correcting them, proving that he's God, and they're trying to kill him. And he's calling them gods. So they would be creative gods that the Word of Faith movement calls them, that they could create by calling them gods. And yet they're trying to stone our Savior at that point. Amen. It's, just, it's just funny how they use that, right. that out of that context. They don't worry about context. <laughs> no, they don't. They take a phrase it is so clear that that's not what he's saying. Well, I think with the Exodus was quoted earlier as being one of the ideas. Um, do you remember when God said to Moses, um, he said, Aaron will be like your prophet, but you will be like God to Aaron. And of course, Moses didn't go around thinking he was God, but he was like a, a, a channel for God's authority. It's like God was speaking through Moses. It's kind of like, too, when they said, when God spoke to them on Mount Sinai, when they said, we'll have Moses speak to us, not God. And God said, you have spoken correctly. You have done that. And so God did speak through Moses. And there were times, clearly, that it was no longer Moses speaking, but it was God speaking through Moses, right? Especially in all the scriptures that he gave. And so you will be, you know, obviously um, we know that Godhood isn't given to human beings because that was the cause of the first fall, the first sin, when Satan said, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when they did that, um, they were trying to get something that wasn't human beings to have. Um, so it's interesting. Anything else on that passage? You are God's. Anything else? That, no, go ahead, Jackson. Uh, and that Bible says, um, Jesus will pick up the term sons of the most high where he refers to himself as the son of God. Um, the psalm was understood in rabbinic circles as an attack on unjust judges yeah. who though they had been given the title gods because of their quasi divine function of exercising judgment are just as mortal as other men. Hmm. Um, it says later the reason the Old Testament judges could be called gods is because they were vehicles of the word of God. But granting that premise, Jesus deserves much more than they to be called God. He is the Word incarnate, who the Father sanctified and sent into the world to save the world. Um, it would have been most natural for the author to say this. Um, how much more permissible is it to use the Word God of Him who is the Word of God? Amen. That's good. That just reinforces, doesn't it? And puts so beautifully what it is we're trying to get at with that passage. Um, but sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Use that that word <coughs> Elohim is used for judge. It's used for angels too, isn't it? Yeah, Elohim in certain Bible passages. Angels, rulers, judges. Yeah. So it's the same word. They're, yeah. It's it's not referred. They're basically God's representative, yeah. is what it's really talking about. Now, think about this. Um, when Peter's writing about Paul's writings, he said some of his writings are hard to understand, right? And we acknowledge that. But notice, though, that those who distort the teaching, he says those who are unstable, and, and what are the other descriptions he, he gives about them? Um, they, they, they twist the word to their destruction. So if you think about it, no one in this room, hopefully, has ever read Psalm 82 and verse 6 and says, oh, Scripture says I'm a God. Wonderful. I'm going to go around and... Speak things into existence and make things happen and create things out of nothing. The only type of people that would do that are people who are seriously lost already or unstable already, right? Yeah. Let's hope that those who have mistaught that will at some point repent. Yeah, right. You know, I would say this, that if any of us here 
God forbid, ever taught something like that, hopefully we would come to a point of repentance, would we not, and say, please forgive me. You know, this is a terrible, shocking teaching that I taught because many go astray. That type of teaching is very destructive to claim to be a god. That's not just a heresy little h. It's not, you know, that's, that's a heresy capital H type, which could damn your soul eternally. Just saying. It really could. Well, it teaches that you're equal with Christ. That's, that's the issue, right? Yeah. That's, and when, when I was exposed to the Word of Faith movement right when I got saved, that's the first thing that I saw was when they were claiming to be gods. Oh, my goodness. And, uh, and that's where, what was my, you know, the, the light bulb. This is an issue. These teachers are false. You would, you would hope that they would repent of that kind of teaching, and let's hope that some will yet. Yeah. Um, that, that's the hope. But if you, yeah, we should run from anyone that makes that claim because what that shows us is a serious lack of humility and reality in that person's life. Um, Psalm 82 verse 7 he says, notice this, and this goes with Psalm 82, verse 6. Nevertheless, oh, you said you are gods, but nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Yeah, so we're not gods. <clears throat> Pharaoh thought he was a god, but he died. His own son died. We're not, you know, if you die, you're not a god. You can't be a God if you die, because the true God never dies. Now, here's a thought, though, and this is from the Dutch Bible. Do Oh, you read Dutch? No, I don't. But um, this, is, this is a quote from Kuiper. In Psalm 82, verse 7, our preferred rendering is, nevertheless, like Adam, you shall die. Yeah. The Hebrew word for man in this passage is Adam. In fact, let me introduce you to a bit of a dilemma here, because there are many places where the name for man is Adam, and some commentators are not sure if, if we're referring to human beings as a whole race, or in some passages they could specifically be referring to Adam, the individual. Just want to point that out. But, here, but, but here's the reality. Uh, weren't we all in Adam anyway? <laughs> so, yeah. So, nevertheless, like Adam, you shall die and fall like any prince. And by the way, how old was Adam when he died? Hmm? 979? Nope, close. He was 930 when he died. The issue is he still died. <laughs> he, he lived a whole millennium almost, you know, and still died. Um, now, the final verse, and we'll close here, and thank you for your patience tonight. I know we haven't been covering an easy subject. And it says, Arise, O God, and God is. Judge the earth. So those who judge will be judged for how they have judged. They'll be judged by the judge, <laughs> which is the Lord himself. And so it's important. It, it, it's kind of like what... what what, what the Lord said when he says, um, the word that I speak will judge, right? Um, and I think that's the, that's the release for us as human beings. All, all we can do is give the word and preach God's word. So in reality, it's the word that's judging. It's not us. We are operating under God's divine authority, and what God's word says is how we render judgment, not through our own power, our own authority. And, um, but there will come a time that God will judge the earth. He says, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations, including this one. So those who are in authority, who are passing ungodly laws, trespassing on people's lives, oppressing the... They will give account to God, and sometimes they forget that. And those...
those that God put in that position of power, that that's who he's, he's referring to, right? Yes. Those are the rulers. And, I mean, just like the rulers we have today. Amen. God put them in power, and he's going to judge them harshly yes. for how they rule. Because they were entrusted with more. That's right. You know, when I make decisions in my life, it affects my family. It, it may affect this church. But if you are the president of the United States, or you're a senator, or you're in a position, well, the decisions you're making will have an impact on much more people, won't it? So the positions we're in, we will give account to God. And if we keep that in mind, it will affect us on how we treat others, right? Um, you know, that's... That's why we always try to see people through the lens of the cross, not through the lens of our own likes or dislikes, you know. Well, guys, we close here, but any thoughts on the psalm we've looked at tonight? Um, stick with the Lord on it. That's good. Read what Scripture says about angels. Don't get caught up in it and don't go crazy with it. You know, is my advice to you. I've been there where, you know, I was taught, you got to bind this spirit. you got to bind that spirit. It's like, no, you don't. Taking another verse out of context. Yeah, it's not in the Bible, binding spirits. And in fact, let me give you a warning. Satan's not going to be bound until the millennium. Right. And you trying to bind him isn't going to work. Um. I'll give you a passage for that too. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. When Paul was harassed by a messenger of Satan, if binding was the real deal, couldn't Paul just say, I bind you, Satan. Get out of here. But what did he do? He pleaded with the Lord three times that the Lord would take that away from him. And the Lord taught him. And, but what did the Lord say to him? Yeah, for my strength is made perfect. And then Paul said, therefore, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so he overcame it by relying on God's grace, and it delivered him from being prideful. Paul was even able to look back and say, because of the abundance of revelation and the, you know, I was getting a little bit arrogant with the abundance of revelation. There was given to me a messenger of Satan. So he saw why God permitted it to keep him humble, to keep him relying on God's grace, and he overcame it. Um, there was another case in Acts chapter 16 where the servant girl harassed Paul and Silas for days. You remember that? These men are men of the most high God sent to show you the way of salvation. And it, and it says it happened for days. If Paul could have just bound the spirit right away, wouldn't he have done that? Why did he wait? Because the Lord hadn't released him to be able to do it. And then after days, he cast out the spirit from the servant girl. Then they were thrown into prison for it, if you remember. And she lost the ability to fortune tell. And, you know, fortune telling is a demonic thing, right? Where they might know information about human beings that no normal human being would. Um, and so they were cast into prison because they lost the ability to make money. But a careful look at these apostles and how they operated, that it will clearly show us that they didn't operate the way that these warfare teachers indicate. I'll try to present today. There is a real spiritual warfare, but don't go beyond what's written. <laughs> Stick with Scripture and uh, trust Him in it. Draw close to God. Amen. It's, it's his yes, Amen. And I had to learn that the hard way, by the way, and not saying something that it didn't take me years to get away from. So I'm not up here tonight sharing something with you that I didn't fall foul to in my own life. So, because um, I get people, oh, you don't believe in all that. It's like, oh, you've never heard my testimony then if you don't think I believe in it. 
but um, it's real. But these people, they just go too far and too deep into it, you know. Um, the real power is in the gospel. It's in the gospel. Let's preach the gospel. Um, Jackson, would you close in prayer? Thank you, sir. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this evening we can come and study your word, Lord. Yes, Lord. We just thank you for providing it to us. We thank you for the grace that you offer us, Lord. We pray that you will just help us to share the word with those that we encounter, and we will just trust in you for our battles, Lord. We won't look to ourselves or to any other person or any other thing that we look yes. to Christ and Christ alone for our our salvation and, and our sanctification, Father. Yes. We trust you and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.